We're back. Love it. I have to take this off because I'm sweating here. I put some kind of thermogenic thing on. <sighs> no, I, I told you. The last thing I thought the work came up and it was. I gotta do it. So until this is done, I'm going to start my party downstairs. Alright, CT. Let's get this going. Here we go. Computer tomography. Alright? So computer tomography scans thin sections of the body with an X ray beam that rotates around the body, producing images of each cross section. Alright? What are the advantages of CT? It eliminates superficial structures because it's going around, differentiates small differences in density of anatomical structures. And then it's the period quality of the image. And you guys will see that as you guys are doing your case studies. Most of the ones I think will probably end up being CT. How's it coming along with those case studies? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You have a sample. So the advantages is elimination of superficial structure, obviously because it's going around in circles, so yeah, it's like that whole concept of oblique, or obliquely. And then you have the differentiating because it's not differences in density, like anatomical structure. Why? Because you have all the different Hounsfield units, okay? And then superior quality of images. That's just the way the kind of works. Sorry. One more second, she said. Because those images have those different colors. 
the Northern Coal System, which is a ground for testing oil um, technology for exchange. And then you have your X-ray source and your filter, which is a bolt-on shape filter between the X-ray tube and the detector ray. Are there any questions? No. All right, so like I was telling you guys, this is your X-ray tube. This is your bolt-on filter, which is kind of like a collimator. Okay? And then as your beads come down to the patient, this is your detector or ray right here. Okay? So you have to always take in consideration that as your tube rotate, because remember it's um, a circular, it's a, it's a ring that goes around. As this goes this way, your detector may also go that way. Okay? All right, now you have your collimators. Um, this is strip the x ray beam to a specific area by reducing scatter. Scatter reduces the image quality and increases patient dose. Collimators control slice thickness by narrowing or widening the x ray beam. Right? So, this is something that you guys can control on your end when you guys are acquired in your acquisition. A creating patient collimator determines the patient dose and Voltage 
All right, so now your pitch, right? The definition for pitch is the table speed divided by the slice thickness in spiral CP. 
So now you have your Hounsfield units, also known as your pixel value or CT numbers. Okay, this was your um, your number accuracy. All right, scales of the CT number is used to judge the nature of the tissue, and then the degree of attenuation is measured in order to make comparison. It quantifies the degree that the structure attenuates in the X-ray beam. So distilled water would be zero. The density of bone would be 1,000, and would be negative 1,000. So, for example, if you have a slice of the abdomen that shows a dark spot on the left kidney, which measures four ounces from the unit, you assume that the that that little area is fluid filled because it's close to water. Does that make sense? And that's how you know the difference between a mass and a cyst. All right. Possible inaccuracy. Um, there's poor equipment calibration or there's imaging graphite. That's what would give you clock and accuracy. Okay. Now you have your slice thickness. This determines the image quality or resolution. The average range would be 0.5 to 10 millimeters. Okay? Thinner slices increases resolution but increases the patient dose. Do you guys understand that concept? Do you guys understand that the thinner the slice, you're going to have awesome resolution, but you're also giving the patient a higher dose of radiation. All right, so what ends up happening? All right, so thicker slices decreases resolution, decreases the dose, and interpolation is required. Interpolation takes the blur out of the image. All right, so what happens is that you have the patient here, and thinner slices, you have more of that overlap that I was talking about, right? So if you have more of the overlap that you can stay on the table for a longer period of time, that means there's more radiation being given to that patient because you're acquiring it at such a small um, smaller slice thickness. Now, if you increase your slice thickness, you have less time on the table. However, you're also jacking your information, right? If you know so enjoy. So if you're jacking that information, interpolation has to come in because every time you go like this and then you're moving, this top part has to be the like that the interpolation has to take place to ensure that this information that was taken from here is just gonna say like okay, I'm with it, we're just gonna assume this is what it's going to be. Okay? And it'll help with the blurring because now you don't have that actual information there. Alright, so the patient chronometer opened to, uh, to its full potential producing the widest slice available. And then you have down here, pre patient chronometer, the chronometer has a narrow opening producing a thinner slice. Okay, so in that thinner slice, you're getting 
a smaller amount of, of area that's being exploited. However, if you put on again through all this area at this moment in slice, you're exposing that radiation to the patient, as opposed to this one over here, you have this larger chunk that's being radiated at that one time. So if you have to go from here to here, that's not going to take long to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So thinner, um, thinner slices gives you awesome resolution, but your trade-off is that you have increased patient dose. Okay? And then it's going to be the opposite for thicker slices. Detail, so you have to think about that. Okay. 
interviewed you want to know if they have allergies if you know what's the reason so patient history is very important just like how you do it in nuclear medicine um, you want the patient to drink two liters of diluted barium based oral contrast over a period of time that's if you're doing an abdomen pelvis you obtain your scalp the gantry doesn't rotate it's just the table that's moving through the um, gantry with the x-ray beam and then you um, do the test injection given to measure the transition time of the bolus from the site to the aorta. So it all depends on where you're at. Some places they know what they're doing. They don't need to do a test injection. They just go ahead and inject the iodine and then follow it with the flush. Okay. And then you have your IV administration via pyro injector. So that's what, that's what you're going to use basically. Um, the pyro injector, you give a um, hundred to 200 ml is injected at a rate of 1.5 to 5 milliliters per minute, okay? And that depends basically on what study you're doing. For an abdomen pelvis, sometimes you may not need 100 milliliters of iodine. You might use 50, and then you will chase it with 50 milliliters of saline, okay? And then the rate will not be 1.5. It might be 2 milliliters. Now this changes based on where your IV is placed. If your IV is in the hand, if you have a 22 gauge, if you have a 20 gauge, if you have an 18 gauge. So this will change how fast the rate of iodine is gonna go into the patient's arm because you're using a power injector, okay? So just take that into consideration. Okay, so common CT imaging acquisitions would be your head, the neck, the spine, the chest, the heart, and the abdomen. Okay. And now you have your quality controls, which you guys did, which was your tube warm-up, CT number, the noise, and uniformity. There's the um, noise, I mean, not, not noise, there's the laser line alignment, which is basically dealing with the, with the, um, lining up with the laser to make sure that it is where it's supposed to be, okay? All right, so with the tube warm-up, that's done daily. You warm up the tube to ensure that the equipment is working properly. Malfunctions and unsafe conditions must be corrected. You turn on the system and follow the manufacturer's recommended warm-up procedure. If any unusual events occur, you contact the service engineer, obviously, and there's no records required of daily equipment warm-up. So if the equipment has been sitting for four hours and you haven't scanned a patient, you need to do a tube warm-up before you do a patient, okay? Because you do not want to crack that tube. We know what every 30 minutes is. It's not being used. Uh -huh. Yeah. Jeez. That's how cold is that room? Very. Oh, that's probably why. But ideally, because I know that in um, at Memorial West, when I used to work there, um, if we didn't have patients in two to three hours, that's like, okay, should we do a two warm up? Yeah, we can wait until the patient gets here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you can. You can wait until you know you're going to get the patient and then go ahead and run it. Because yeah. if you know you're not getting another, yeah, if you know you're not going to get a patient anytime soon, what's the purpose of, you know, putting, exerting all that heat to the atom? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this is your CT number for water, and that's performed daily. It checks daily con um, consistency of the CT number of water, follows the manufacturer's pr um, procedure to correct, um, correctly image and analyze the water phantom, and keep record for at least one year. Then you have your uniformity, and this measures the ability of the scanner to yield the same CT number regardless of the location of the region of interest within a homogeneous object. So phantoms reconstructed of solid acrylic 
or one that is filled with distilled water is used, and several ROIs are placed within the phantom, there should be no more than plus or minus two Hounsfield variations from any region of interest placed at the center of the phantom compared to the periphery. And this is done daily, and you keep this records for at least one year. This is what it should look like. Yes? Okay. And then you have your noise. The noise is measured by obtaining a standard deviation of the CT numbers within the region of interest and it should not exceed 10. A water phantom of the uniform density is scanned, performed at installation, and then monthly. And these records are kept for one year. All right, do you guys have any questions? I don't have questions about this, but I got questions about a lot of other stuff. That's not pertaining to PET and CT? Correct. All right, give me a minute. Anyone have any questions pertaining to PET and CT? All right, so I'm going to 